Good morning, everyone. God has a story. Uh, God is actually uh, creating a story in each and every one of you. That is your heavenly mandate. That is your, uh, your mandate that God has given you for every one of you, because God is creating a story in each one of you. And so if you are going through any, uh, any process or any situation in your life, and you are wondering why, I want you to know that God is in the process of creating the story, because that is the story that somebody needs to hear. That's our heavenly mandate because the Bible says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, He said that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, He will empower you, what? To tell the story, to be my witnesses. What does it, what does it mean to be, your, to be God's witness? To be a witness means you need to testify about something, isn't it? And for you to testify about something, you have to testify about what God has done in your life. And that's your heavenly mandate that we are to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And he said, Pastor, but it's so difficult to go through this process. But we sang the song just now, and I think we need to know that, that when God's kingdom come upon us, we already have the victory. The Bible says, in this world, you will have tribulation because Donald Trump has taken office <laughs> there were two things, two major happenings in my, in my family uh, last week. The first was Donald Trump become president. And the second one is my wife got a graduate diploma in uh, Christian studies. <laughs> this, is another, this is a small step for her because she's going to, uh, she's going to go further. Uh, because I... In, he, in her heart, she has a heavenly mandate from God. She hears from the Lord uh, the things that she needs to do. And every one of us needs to do that. Every one of us needs to be pursuing our heavenly mandate. Or else, after 80, 90 years here on earth, and you die, you go to the tomb and you, the tomb will write, although it's not officially there, he said, here lies a man or woman who doesn't know his heavenly mandate. Here lies a man or woman who doesn't know what he was on earth for. And that's the tragedy if we go to death like that. We must know our heavenly mandate. There are three things as we go through the, the world. You know, everybody is looking for a solution. And that's why Philippines elected Duterte, although, you know, a lot of people don't like that's why America elected Donald Trump, because everybody is looking for a solution. No one is able to provide it. And so even, even, even Duterte or, or Donald Trump or Putin. But brothers and sisters, every one of us need to know that we have what God is trying to tell the world. In this world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Is that, that means rejoice. Don't even, don't even worry about it. Even when the ring it goes down, even when things are so bad, he said, be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. That's the wonderful thing about the gospel of the kingdom. Because the kingdom of God it's beyond. You see, when, when the kingdom of God comes upon us, and that's why we need to pray. I hope that you pray this every day. I hope that you pray, your, my, your kingdom come, Lord. I hope you will pray in your office as you go into your office and say, Lord, your kingdom come upon this place. Because when God's kingdom come, there will, there will be a few things uh, that you can expect. We sang it just now, you know, Jehovah Jireh. God's kingdom, when God's kingdom come, He has got His provision. 
See, all over the world, people are rushing here and there just to get provision, isn't it? But God says that He is our Jehovah Jireh. Secondly, a lot of people are trying to say, oh, I'm in this difficult situation. But they do not know that Jesus Christ has already said, I am Jehovah Nissi. I am your victory. That's why we sing the song. Uh, we sang the song just now. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of the world, the things of the world that is turmoil, the things of the world that is so stormy, the things of the world that is so... Uh, 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 it makes our hearts uh, unsettled. The things of the world that will grow strangely dim. They will be quiet in the light of His glory. His glory is the peace of God. And then we have got, we sang Jehovah Shalom. Jesus, you are my peace. He is the Prince of Peace. I tell you, there's, any, there's nothing that affects us that I can overcome this peace. Very clearly, when the doctors pronounced that I had uh, thyroid cancer, it's like this whole a dark sky came upon me. The whole, it's like a whole weight of depression comes upon me. And as I got into the car, I was talking to my wife as, as we talked, as I, as I humbled my heart before her and I was like uh, asking her to, uh, I mean, we were just talking. Uh, I, was just, uh, I was just vulnerable at that time because when the, a bad news comes like that, you just have to, uh, be vulnerable before the Lord, be vulnerable before your wife, be vulnerable before, before the people of God. And as, I begin, as we begin to talk, I remember we were driving towards the leaders' camp at, uh, uh, at Bukit Tinggi there. I could sense the peace of God just came down upon me. One minute, the whole world was crushing me. The second minute, when the peace of God came, it was zoom. It's like, I knew that everything would be okay. That's the power of the peace of God. That when the Prince of Peace comes into your life, it was in the car. The Prince of Peace is like there's no force that can come against this power of God's peace. And that's why he said, he said I am your peace who has broken down every wall that holds that keeps you every wall of fear that that uh, that that, that uh, surrounds us hopelessness fear anything right now that you are facing brothers and sisters today i hope that you invite the prince of peace to come into your life and when the Prince of Peace comes in, there's nothing, no wall can keep, keep you in. Today, I want to talk to you about how we can experience the power of God. Can I have the PowerPoint? The most, the most powerful words in the whole Bible, I thought, is found in uh, Matthew chapter 18. Just now we read that. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 to 20. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 to 20. Okay. Truly I tell you, when, when the Bible, I, I, I taught you before, isn't it? When the Lord Jesus Christ said, verily, verily, or truly, truly, ah, we better take attention. We, we better pick up our ears and hear what He said. He who has ears, let him hear. Because a lot of us, we do not hear. One of the things that we really need to know, brothers and sisters, in order for your life to be fruitful, once, one is you need to know that Jesus Christ has overcome the world. And so you know that whatever you're going through, you know 
that you have the victory. And so you, and in fact, the Bible says, be anxious for nothing because Jesus Christ has the victory. Whether you are going through the, uh, the, the doctor's examination, whether you are going through uh, any situation in life, you must know that Jesus Christ has already got your victory. And so there should not, the, 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 we, we, we should not be shaken. Everything else can be shaken because our life is upon the rock. The rock is not movable and Christ, Jesus Christ is in, on the rock. It's the rock. Secondly, we must know that God has given us the ability to be fruitful. And, and we, I, I spoke to you about how if we are able to listen, a lot of people that listen, that come to church, they, 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 they listen, but they do not hear. And that's why a lot of things are not fruitful. But those with good soil are those who hear. Not just hear with your ears, uh, brothers and sisters, hear with your heart. Because God is one person that really desires to speak to us. Hear with your heart. Don't hear just the sound of it. Uh, just, just over, over breakfast, one sister was telling us how when, he, when she, you know, he said this, this last few weeks we have been talk, talking about hearing God's word, hearing God, and she wanted to hear God. And so she did something different. And, and you know, when she does something different, I think the next, the next week she came to church and she, I mean, it was not what she expected, but God spoke to her. And so, brothers and sisters, when we begin to desire to hear God, God will speak. And when we hear God, it will be fruitful because the Bible says it will be 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. To be fruitful, you need to hear the Word of God. And so, truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Just now we read the passage, whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. What a powerful word. This, the Lord Jesus Christ actually is using the, the language of the Sanhedrin. You know the Sanhedrin is a, a group of uh, religious leaders, about 23, 23 to 71. And it has always got to be an uh, uneven number, odd number. Because when they make a decision and when they sort of uh, decide, you cannot have 5-5. Five, five, uh, so it has to be, there has to be uh, an odd number so that uh, the nay or the ye will win. You know, and so same thing in Malaysia. Malaysia, we have got the Jakim uh, in, uh, in the federal level. And so they are the ones that issue the fatwas or the jayas on the state level. And so there are a lot of uh, things in the Quran or things in the Bible that, uh, for example, you must rest on the Sabbath. But, how, but what, what does it mean to, be, to rest in the, uh, on Sabbath? You know, you must rest. And so can, uh, he said, Pastor, can I go fishing on, su on Sunday? Is that, is that resting? Can I go exercising? Is that resting? And so the, the Sanhedrin will make a decision and say, okay, hot dog in the hot dog, the dog in the hot dog is not, uh, uh, it's not haram or something like that, you know. They will make a, 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 a fatwa, a decision, yeah. Or if... Uh, uh, Pokemon in Malaysia is, uh, is uh, allowed or something like that. There will be a fatwa that comes from the, uh, the Sanhedrin council that will decide because there are so many laws in the Bible. You don't really know what uh, the, the, the ordinary people don't really understand. And so they're dependent on this, uh, the Sanhedrin. But now what, what, does the, what does the Bible say? Is that the Holy Spirit is in us, isn't it? And He is our teacher. Those who really want to hear, the Holy Spirit will begin to teach us. And so, 
uh, he is actually using, Jesus is actually using the language of the Sanhedrin when he said that. That means that whatever we permit will be permitted in heaven. Whatever we forbid will be forbidden in heaven. Actually, it's very powerful. Jesus Christ is trying to say that there is, a, that we are as a church, it's like a parliament. We are the ones that make the decision. And that's why uh, churches' prayer meetings, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. Huh? I'm, just, I'm just trying to t t teach you something. Churches' prayer meetings are the worst attended uh, why? Because this is the, the most uh, fought place, the prayer meeting especially, because the devil knows that this is going to happen, that when, uh, when the church comes together and, uh, and agree, uh, if two, just now you also read, if two of you agree, or two or three of you agree on anything, my father will do it. There's such a power, isn't it? A, uh, 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 a spiritual parliament uh, in the church. Uh, Jesus actually has a very strong, uh, st very strong view about the church. You realize that he has such a passion. Although when he came to earth that time, the church was terrible condition because the, the Pharisees were loading the people with a lot of uh, heavy duty laws that uh, that the people cannot really do, you know, and so the people are so afraid of the Pharisees and, and uh, the church was uh, full of hypocrisy. In fact, Jesus said, you people, oh, you are like a uh, whitewashed tombstone. You, are so, you look so well outside. You have robes that uh, you dress up so well. You know, you pray out in the, in the center of the street and, you know, every time the, the bell rings, you go and pray. You, you know, every time there's time for prayer, you, we, we see you praying. You know, you are, you are like whitewashed tombstone. You are looking so good on the outside, but inside you are full of deadly bones. You are so dirty inside. In fact, in fact Jesus came and really uh, hantam them uh, properly. But Jesus has got such a wonderful view about the church and despite that, he came and said, hey, why are you making my father's house a den of robbers? Why are you doing all other things? My father's house is a house of prayer. Jesus knew about this injunction because he knows that the father's house is going to be a house of prayer and this is going to establish what's going to happen in heaven and on earth. It's such a powerful thing. He has got such a passion for the house of God. But people are forgetting about that, isn't it? Nowadays, people say, ah, oh, yeah, bring my son to church. They will, the, the church will teach them very good things. Huh? You know, it's all about wrong concept. Just making a good person? No. It's making a powerful person. Or go, lah, go to the church, good music. Oh, we begin to turn the church into a place of entertainment. I wonder what Jesus will do when he comes to the churches nowadays. Oh, go to the churches, the good, good speakers there. You know, we are itching to hear what we want to hear. Jesus has such a strong, strong thing about the church. Let me, let me, let's read together this passage, uh, 16 verse uh, 13 to 19. Let's read together. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. See, this is, you know, Peter said, oh, some people said you are John the Baptist, Elijah, but Jesus said, what do you say I am? And he said, you are Messiah, Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, man has not told you that. 
it was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. So brothers and sisters, when you hear God, that means it was revealed to you by our Heavenly Father. It's a precious word. And so every time you come to church, and when you hear something stir in your heart, well, grab it because it is a word that the Father in heaven released to you. It is the key to the kingdom of heaven. Revelation is the key to the kingdom of heaven. Is that upon this rock, upon this revelation that you know was revealed to you, you are that, that I am Christ, the Son of the living God, is upon this revelation that I will build my church. The revelation of God is powerful, brothers and sisters. That's why when we come, we must begin to receive God's revelation. Sometimes the Word of God just comes generally. I think you heard that from Pastor Jeremiah. Pastor Jeremiah always say that. Sometimes the Word of God comes generally to everybody, but the Holy Spirit takes a particular word and apply it to your life because your life situation is very different from the others. And so when you catch that, you must hold it as, to, as, as a revelation to the key of the kingdom of heaven for you because God is, going giving, is giving us keys. God is giving us keys to our situation. Every one of us have got different situation. It is very powerful. That's why we come here, we receive life, keys to life. God has the words of eternal life. Uh, read you this, this story account. Do you give keys to make to uh, to uh, to uh, give your happy key to others? You, every one of us has a happy key. This uh, this uh, writer, uh, Sydney Harry, uh, was with with a friend, and uh, the two of them went to the newsstand to buy uh, to buy newspaper. And Sydney Harry saw that this news, news vendor is so rude and so, uh, so unfriendly, never, never reply to people and just, uh, so, you know, uh, really unfriendly. But this friend of his always said thank you and really treat the newspaper vendor very nicely. And so this Harry, Harry was saying that, isn't this a terrible attitude by this vendor? Uh, so the friend said, oh, he, no, he's, he's like that every night. But so Harry said, why are you so kind to him? So the friend said, why do I want him to decide my behavior? Everyone has a happy key, but we unconsciously handed it over to others to be in charge of our happiness. One lady will say, I live very unhappily because my husband is always on business. She has put the happy key into the hands of her husband. One of the mothers said, my child is so disobedient and taught me to be angry. And make me angry. She handed the key, her happy key, to her, to her child. A man may say, oh, my boss don't appreciate me and I'm so down. He has handed the happy key to the boss. But the mother-in-law said, oh, my daughter-in-law is not, not obedient at all. What happened? She has handed the happy key to the daughter-in-law. Every one of these people have made the same decision. They have taken their own happy key and handed it to somebody else. Brothers and sisters, God has handed us some keys. In fact, He's determining what happens on earth and in heaven. He's given us the keys. See, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Those of you who have been in church for a while, you will know that this is God's revelation to new life. Pastor Jeremiah has, has, uh, has mentioned this quite a few times, and we must all know that, that the church, we hear in new life, of course, the other churches also, but it was specifically revealed to us, the church is the vehicle of the movement of the kingdom of heaven on earth. That means when the, God's kingdom wants to move on some, somebody, when God's kingdom wants to move in certain ways, we are the vehicle because God has given us the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. And the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, when you begin to, uh, when God brings you into contact with somebody, 
they will need the gospel of the kingdom of heaven because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Because when God's kingdom come upon their lives, the Lord will come with Jehovah Jireh. He will come as Jehovah Shalom. He will come as Jehovah Nisi. These are the things that people need. I was seated uh, with, uh, after visiting somebody in the ICU uh, the other week. Uh, I came out of the ICU, I was seated there, and there's this lady who was talking up to me about transitions in life, how it's such a struggle in life. And, and suddenly I, I felt there was a door open. And I began to tell her that every one of us need three things. I said, uh, you need faith because you must know that somebody is in charge of your life. God is in charge. You need faith, hope, and love. You need to have hope because you need to have a bright future. And every one of us need love because we are built to love. We, our relationship with people on the basis of love, not on the basis of hatred. People nowadays would like to be, to, uh, the devil would like to get us to hate. We would get us to have attitude of kya su, kya si, kya, all, all the fear, you know. Would, would try to make us judgmental about others. That, that's why when we, uh, when God taught us, when the Bible, I, you know, when I was sharing with you how the three keys, each one of us must pray, must ask, and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. Why is Jesus so confident? He said, ask and you will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. It's not about you ask, maybe you will you'll be given. No. Jesus is so confident, you know, because there are three things. First of all, you must know that God is a generous God. He said, if you earthly fathers know how to give good gifts to you, how much more I am a generous God. And so, brothers and sisters, we must pray with that basis. Because a lot of us pray with the basis of God being such a, a miserly God and say, hey, you better buck up. I won't give you anything. That's the God that we are praying to. But I'm trying to teach you, brothers and sisters, that it is the wrong concept of a God that you are believing. That we must believe that God is a good God. That's why the prodigal son, without having even done anything, came back to the father and he get the best robe, he get the feather calf, he get the ring of authority, he get the shoes of sonship. Wow! That's the generosity of our Father. That's the wonderful thing of our Father. Secondly, you cannot pray if you don't have love. If you have judgment and say, oh, this is a lock in this, this person's eye. But when we humble ourselves and don't go and look and judge other people, we have such a love for other people. That's what I've been trying to teach you, that we are not individuals. We are, yes, we are individuals in our relationship with God, but we must also look that we are part of the body of Christ because that's where the power comes from. One finger on its own is not powerful, but unless it's joined with the, with the rest of the body, then it's, it, can be, it can be useful. See, ASK is ask on the basis of not being judgmental on others. Secondly, know that God is such a generous God. Thirdly, you must know that it is asked on the basis of that you treasure the things of God. Don't throw pearls to the pigs. When you begin to treasure, seek you first the kingdom of God. That's, that's, that's what it means that I value, I honour the things of God. I, I, I treasure the things of God. And when we do that, it is a powerful, powerful time when we ASK. What saps the power? The power of God is set by conflicts, by unforgiveness, by unreconciled relationships in church. And that's why it's important that Jesus taught us that, that we need to have reconciliation in church. 
because we are such a powerful thing and the first thing that the enemy will do is cause conflict in church. I'm sure you have heard when you go to different churches, I've heard so many stories, so much conflict among leadership, so much conflict among, among church members until the church is no longer powerless. It's become a laughing stock. It's important for us to know that. Say, brothers and sisters, he says here, if your brother sins against you, that means if he has offended you, go and show him his fault. Just the two of you. Don't go to another person. Because we like to do that. We like to he hurt me, so I go and tell somebody else, no, that person. Huh? No, God is saying, go straight to that person. Don't involve other people. Only when he doesn't, doesn't humble himself, so the first step is humility. Kingdom of God is always like that. Always starts with humility. The first thing that Jesus showed is that you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? you become like this little child. Little child, huh, don't have pride one, you know. That's why they cry everywhere. <laughs> they don't care. They don't have pride. They just cry everywhere. We all dare not cry. We got so much pride, ma. we dare not cry. First of all, it's humility. If you humble yourselves, I tell you, it's going to be powerful. Next step, reconciliation, yeah? Reconciliation, and then if, if they don't no, listen, Take one or two others along so that it may be established, the witnesses. And then only the church gets involved. But a lot of us, we don't. We try to get the church involved. We try to get the pastor. Pastor, you must solve this problem. No, the pastor is not responsible for that. You have to go to that person. You have to do that. We must not distance... A lot of churches, they distance themselves. A lot of people, you know, I don't like him. Okay, I... The church is so big, I can sit on the other end. <laughs> Cannot. Because you will set the power of the church. It's, the church is not, it's, it's not going to be powerful if you do that. A lot of us distance ourselves. A lot of us sweep it under the eye. Now, mind, I, can, I just worship God. I just sit at the right there. And after worship, I just go up. No need to, no need to associate with anyone. That's not what the church is supposed to be. Brothers and sisters, we must begin to not, not, don't allow gossip also. When somebody comes and gossip to you about somebody else, three things you must tell them. You must ask them, have you been to them? Have you been to the person that have offended you? Yeah? Have you told them about this already? Secondly, you must do, you ask them, what would you like me to do for you here? I don't want to just receive from you just the, all the gossip. What do you want me to do? Uh, thirdly, would you like me to come with you to talk to them? Yeah, do resolve it directly rather than, you know, just listen, listen, and then hear all the gossip. Refuse to take sides. The body of Christ, we cannot take sides. Yeah. And so, what makes the church powerful? What makes us powerful is unity in solidarity. Matthew chapter 18, again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you, they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. This is the context, you know, the same context that we are reading, brothers and sisters. Yeah? For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. Wow, so powerful. So powerful. I remember when I was in Form 6, uh, I belong to a small Christian fellowship. And I, I remember how I was so in love with the Lord. That was my first love. I, was, I so loved Him that I would go to church, uh, go to school every morning very early. I had to, mind you, I have to, from Sungai Bersi, I have to take a bus, well, maybe 6 o'clock, I take a bus to, uh, to Klang bus station and then take another bus to uh, Churras, I, I studied Sekolah Menengah Teknik in Churras and, and uh, you know my school is very far away from the, from the main road and so I took the Churras bus, after that I have to walk nearly 
uh, more than one kilometer just to go to, go, go to my school. And uh, I would go to the back of the laboratory, the science laboratory, because the, the laboratory is the furthest away from, from everybody. And so that's where I sit next to the drain there and I will pray. I remember the fire was so strong, just praying together with some of my friends, you know. I love praying with them. I really, there was such a unity in our hearts, such a you know, desire for God. We, we, I, I don't know what we really prayed for, but there was such a unity to just love God, to just, you know, and, and I believe God really heard our prayers, you know. I, uh, uh, I remember when we first, when we first came back from uh, U.S., uh, Sister Vivian, Pastor Raymond, uh, who else? A, a, few, a few more came to our house and every Saturday morning we'll go up to the attic and there was such a unity in our prayer. We will be praying for the nation and I tell you something birthed out of that. Something birthed out of that. The prayer ministry and different things birthed out of it. And it's such powerful and I know that the, the small Christian group, small, a few of us, I remember counting, uh, there are four pastors that came out of the, our fellowship. One uh, pastor together with David Swan Chu now in, uh, uh, in Tabernacle of David. That's the, the wife of David Swan Chu. And then now the, the other one is uh, Ronnie Chin, pastor, uh, Revival Center now. He's the assistant superintendent of the AOG Church. And then uh, another two, one in, in, uh, in Ipoh and, you know, and another leading a ministry. I thought, wow. Brothers and sisters, that's the power when we begin to pray. Heaven listens to us. Heaven listens to us. Um, the, the reason why new life, actually, uh, each time I look at the way that we have grown as a group of churches, really cannot say anything glorious about ourselves because it is really the grace of God. Because when I look at Pastor Jeremiah, Pastor Lawrence, and myself, we were so different people. We, our opinions are so different sometimes. And I think sometimes Pastor Jeremiah don't know what to do with Pastor Lawrence and myself because we were all on different sides of the fence all the time. <laughs> and we were, you know, but after we argue, after we, you know, settle on a position, we just submit ourselves to one another. And we just unite. And that's how I think we, be, we are able to come so far. A unity in solidarity. Ruth, Naomi is like that. Naomi, a cursed woman. The husband died, the two sons died. She has got nothing. And Ruth said, don't ask me to leave you. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. Wow, such a unity. And you know, God bless her. She married Boaz and she came into the line of the Lord Jesus Christ. Same thing with David and Jonathan. David and Jonathan, the Bible says, they were one in spirit. They were so united that even though Jonathan deserves, I mean, was the, was the rightful heir to Saul's kingdom, but he saw that God has chosen David. And so he was even willing to submit himself to David and said, David, you are going to take the throne. Uh, when I attended the graduation, uh, Grace graduation in Penang, uh, the, the president of the Baptist, Malaysian Baptist Theological Seminary said, you know, we all play different roles in life. One, we, sometimes we play the main role and a lot of us play the secondary role. But it doesn't matter because those roles, God sees the same. So Jonathan may play the secondary role, but because he receives this mandate from God, I believe that he will receive the same reward in heaven. Brothers and sisters, Jesus do that when he wants to pray for people, and if you don't agree with him to raise the dead, you better get out of the house. He said, you go. He only keep those who will agree with him. Elder Jung is not here, so I can talk about him. <laughs> you know, he, um, last week, he, when he heard me telling the church about 
let's, let's buy over the, the factory lot across the road. Immediately, he came to my office the next, uh, the next week and said, Pastor, if God has spoken through you, we must agree with you. We must pray together. So, Pastor, I want to pray with you every day. And I thought, wow, he's one person that the reason why I take him to minister uh, is because he really opened his heart and unite, unite with me. And I, I find it very powerful when there's unity. So, brothers and sisters, if you, if you have somebody in your cell group that has got a kindred spirit with you, if your wife is willing to pray with you, because, you know, one of the reasons why husband and wife cannot pray together is the enemy is always trying to cause that, you know, hard to pray, because they are the most united, isn't it? And when there's great unity, great power come out of it. That's why I appreciate uh, Pastor Law and Vivian. They pray for us every day. They're so united in terms of prayer. And I really appreciate that. I think they're doing a powerful work in that sense. And so I, I was telling them I, I must really pray, cover them in prayer because this is a powerhouse and the enemy will try to disrupt it. And so brothers and sisters, it says when two agree on anything, the reason why I gather all of you uh, at the end of the service for benediction and I try to get you all to say together with me, I say, God is a good God. If two or three of you agree with me, I tell you, we're going to experience the power of God being manifested. If you, two or three of you agree with me, you know, that when we lay hands on the sick, they will recover, things will begin to happen. There's great power when there is such a unity. I'm not, it's not just mouthing words. Some of, some of us might just mouth words, but there are some of us who catch it and unite together. And I tell you, it's a powerful time. I'm just not trying to get you to, to embarrass yourself, to come up here, no, bro, no pastor, uh, pastor is not so bad. <laughs> pastor wants, wants us to have this sense of the power of God, this sense of uh, experiencing the, such a wonderful, you know, wonderful work of God. God is at work, brothers and sisters. I just heard a wonderful testimony of how a brother who just joined our church not recently gave up smoking. Three over years, smoked two packets a day. Wow. Why? Because there's such a unity. Because the cell leader was really, really having such a heart for him, wanting to pray for him. God is at work. God transforms. Trans I hear stories of God's transformation. Because there's somebody who believes that God is at work in the body of Christ. Amen. So let me get the worship team to come up. We're going to sing the song, Christ is, uh, the Lord is enough for me. And I just want to, want to get us all to stand. If you can, just come in front here, uh, present yourself to the Lord once again and say, Lord, I, I want to hear you. I desire that you will reveal to me a revelation of your love, a revelation of your power, a revelation of your goodness. Hallelujah. Let's all come in front. If